You're listening to a Roddenberry podcast. Mission Log Prodigy, a Roddenberry Star Trek podcast. Supplemental. Season 1 Recap, Part 2. Episodes 6 through 10. Welcome into another episode of Mission Log Prodigy, a Roddenberry Star Trek podcast. I'm Norman Lau. And I'm Ashley Victoria Robinson, just like our flagship Mission Log podcast. Each week here on Mission Log Prodigy, we discuss every episode of this animated series, discover what makes each of them special, and see if there are any morals, meanings, or messages that we have learned. However, as Star Trek Prodigy is on a break until later this year, sad face. Instead of our usual review show, this week we have a very special episode for all of the Star Trek Prodigy fans. We're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to look at the second five episodes of Star Trek Prodigy from a more adult fan's point of view, because this series speaks to older Trek fans as much as it does to our adorable and powerful younger cadets. And this show is produced for both YouTube and as a regular podcast. So please be sure to engage the like button and subscribe to Mission Log Prodigy here on the Roddenberry Entertainment YouTube channel. And please make sure to listen on podcasts.roddenberry.com or Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts, wherever you find your podcast or whatever your specific podcatcher of choice is, podcast catcher of choices. You can also follow Mission Log Prodigy on Twitter at ML underscore Prodigy to keep up with all the latest news and updates like these supplementals and any of the details that we're going to try and get to you as soon as they get to us. We also love talking about other things, Star Trek, all things Star Trek, because we're Star Trek fans. Mm -hmm. And Ashley has a, a very special story for all of us before we jump into the main content of Star Trek Prodigy episodes six through 10. So what do you have for us, Ashley? That is true. And if you are Star Trek fans and if you're here, why wouldn't you be? I'm sure you are all enthralled by Star Trek Picard season two currently airing and in Los Angeles, California, they have set up a 10 forward experience, kind of mocking up, not mocking up, but in creating a bar inspired by mm. <laughs> 10 forward in its OG initiation in Los Angeles in the historic forward district on forward street. And I actually went with John champion who oh. you probably know if you have been puttering around this network for a little while. So it was our first proper IRL hang since I auditioned to work with Bush and Log however many years ago that was now. I don't know. It was before the pandemic. So that mm. was really, really cool. Uh, it is a huge space. I was shocked at how big it was. And my favorite detail about the bar is all of these cool little photos that they have on the wall. So they mm -hmm. have paid some cosplayers who like come and hang out. When we were there, there was an awesome and Dorian and a Vulcan. So with the human uh, yourself, you kind of like form the founders of the Federation, in your oh, fingers, which is which is very neat. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if that was intentional or not, because I've seen some other ones where it's not always an Andorian and Vulcan. But when we were there, it was and they've paid some of these cosplayers to take some sort of supplementary photos that you'll see on the wall. And it'll be just like folks hanging out on the beach or like a Vulcan parent and a Vulcan child and the Vulcan child is smiling, which isn't canon, but it's okay. Cause she's really, really cute. Mm. And they've mixed them in with actual um, production stills from iconic moments in Star Trek history, featuring Guinan and Jean-Luc Picard. Oh, neat. Okay. It, it does beg the question who took these photos. The answer is the onset photographer, mm. but the ambiance just with little details like that really makes it feel like it is lived in and it is lived in within the world of star trek uh your ticket gets you two drinks and food from whatever featured food truck there is i don't drink alcohol uh so they had a really really good mocktail but they have fun names like um the picard sour they had an earl gray martini which i think earl gray tea is horrible but <laughs> a lot of people were getting and seemed very very happy with um and I was just overall really, really impressed with it. I hope that this teaches Paramount and marketing that like pop-up experiences like this really, really work and they work with the specifics. They had a bunch of signages at the bar that were specific brands or types of drinks that we know from Star Trek. And then they also had a cute little merch booth in the back where you could buy like the Chateau Picard wine or sure. some 
some questionable blue ale that we've all heard lauded around on the show uh, and a lot of really neat, like 10 forward shirts. So okay. my hope coming out of this is that we get one of these every time something new comes up. I can't wait to see the lower decks pop up, the prodigy pop up. Like there has to be something where it can be all ages. Kids can make Murph colored slime. Like th- this is a great idea. I hope they tour this or bring it to uh, Mission Chicago or STLV, because even though we were on a time limit for both, I think, COVID safety and to get as many folks through as possible, when it's all it's all your people there and uh, to quote cheers, feels like home. I was I was really impressed with the 10 forward experience. That's what I've heard. And I think because a- across the board, a lot of the people that have that have talked to me about it, you, uh, Shar, uh, John, I think the one thing that's special about something like this is that it's the immersion factor. Yep. You know, they do not skimp on the immersion factor. And ever since the Star Trek Hilton in Las Vegas experience closed, I think a lot of fans have been trying to find Bring the next quarks. best thing, which <laughs> mm-hmm. was the Quarks bar. It was very immersive. It had all the qualities that you would want if you were, say, mentally projecting being on Deep Space Nine, being on the promenade and then walking into Quarks. So now you have this because it's tying in the new series. And from what I understand, for what has been described, it is a a pitch perfect recreation of the set that was on the first episode of Picard on Stargazer, if that's correct. Yes. It, the, the dimensions are a little different. Mm hmm. Because it's not the set. Uh, the set was shot on a set. <laughs> True enough. Yeah. Uh, but it's very, it's very, very close. Yes. Right. Which is so, why I would more say inspired by because there's no bathrooms. You got to walk like a mile to go to the bathroom. What? That's weird. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just in a weird part of LA where like the bathrooms are for the whole complex. <laughs> that's very, that's, I think it's kind of like very like in universe because you never really see bathrooms on any starships you, either. You know what? Right? Fair. Very yeah. fair. <laughs> <laughs> you think that uh, was there talk or did you talk to anyone? Uh, in in the bar about uh, anyone's plans on having it like extend to the Midwest or the East Coast? Because I know a lot of fans on social media that are from the Midwest and the East Coast are saying, when are we going to get our shot? Because mm-hmm. you know, there's that whole, oh man, they're in LA. LA gets all the good stuff. Well, because uh-huh. it's in LA, right? I mean, that's true. And the FOMO is real. Um, everyone that I spoke to said, I don't know. I hope so. So my my recommendation for stuff like that is always to like go to the source, like literally tweet at Paramount Plus or CBS and tell them that this is what you want, because Mm. sometimes when you do live in a big center like L.A. or Chicago or New York, and that is where a lot of your business is, you can't see beyond the end of your nose. So like tell them that you would want to see this come to your town or tell them that you would pay to see because that's what's going to drive it ultimately is whether or not this is profitable um or if you work with your local convention or you know someone who works with like a local convention or a local event have them reach out and see if people would um be interested in even the discussion because having the discussion doesn't necessarily make sure that it would happen but it puts a bug in people's ears so if it's not this experience it might be the next one or strange new world or i don't know we're we're like coming into this time where there's going to be like five star trek shows on the air at the same time if prodigy comes back kind of soon so uh, uh hopefully there's a lot to go around but no confirmations but a lot of hope from everyone who was certainly working there last night. I'll share you. I mean, you have uh, New York City Comic Con. You have, uh, obviously, it may be too late for Star Trek Chicago, which is going to be happening in yeah, the first weekend yeah, of yeah. April. We also have Dragon Con. So th- there are opportunities there. And let's put it, let, you know, let's, let's put it in terms that people understand. And let's be completely honest. If you can put up a pop-up spirit of Halloween, huge warehouse of costumes yep. anywhere, you can probably put up one of these in that space as well. Absolutely. You know. And, uh, you know, Spirit Halloween's only got to be up for one month. Exactly. Exactly. So uh, let's hope that everyone gets their chance at um, enjoying something like that, a themed experience. But thanks. Thanks for that, Ashley. I appreciate that. I'm sure all of our listeners will appreciate that, too, because it's something that we rarely get a chance to hear about um, mm-hmm. from the from the the boots on the ground. Yeah. You know, for our investigative reporter, Ashley V. Robinson. So let's get into it. Let's get into Star Trek Prodigy. We're going to be talking about the back half of season 
one. Why did I sound like a sportscaster right there? I'm like, we're going to be talking about the back half of season one, the Star Trek Prodigy. And uh, we're gonna... anyway, I, I get into How that How did the sometimes. Niners do today, Norm? <laughs> oh, the Niners, Niners. Uh, we're going to have to go all the way back to uh, take me out to the hollow suite, of which I do like. But we're going to go into the back half of uh, Prodigy here with these episodes. Episode six, Kobayashi. Episode seven, first con tact. Episode eight, time amok. Episode nine, a moral star or Tars Lamora, part one, and episode ten, a moral star, part two. So I have some very specific questions I've always wanted to ask Ashley about in this format because we are going into looking at these episodes in a more mature adult type of way because that's the format of this supplemental. And the first question is. Did you find this series of episodes more entertaining than the first five? Overall, I would say yes, with this like huge asterisk and caveat that they are doing a different job than the first five. Mm -hmm. Uh, They have the benefit of the first five that have come before them. Uh, But these are a lot more serialized than the first five, which just appeals to me and my sensibilities and what I like in television, but also because they have the power of the back five, the first five, excuse me, dry, driving them. They're able to do things that are a little more complex, uh, a little more emotional and a little more narrative driven, which these five episodes to me really, quote, feel like Star Trek, unquote. And it's not that the first five didn't, but these feel and I think we talked about these each week when we did our episodes. These feel much more canonized to something like Deep Space Nine, TNG, Voyager, Enterprise Mm -hmm. versus the initial five, which were like setting up the rules of the world, kind of getting you like Lower Decks had to do used to looking at Star Trek in this way. So overall, I would say that I did, but it's just because of the nature of these episodes. Did you like these five episodes better? I think so. And I think it's Mm -hmm. because uh, very similar to what you're saying, they are building off of a very strong start of the first five episodes. And now you're paying attention more towards the characterizations as opposed to the, the world building dynamics and details of what is the proto star? Where did these characters come from? Who is on the chase? How are they getting away? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And now when you're dealing with very specific, uh, specific character moments and character building moments, especially with say Dal, Gwen, Rock Talk, just to name like the first few characters in these next few episodes, I think that we're paying more attention to what do the new details mean and Mm. why, right? Because the morals and meanings and messages, I think with every episode, they're there. They're stronger in some degrees than others, and some are more obvious than others. But I think that uh, in the first five episodes, we are really dealing more with Dal and Gwen, kind of like yes. their dynamic, that their dynamic as individual characters, and then their dynamic obviously coming together as a whole. Who's going to be yes. the captain, right? Yes. Is there that tension there? <laughs> and, and we still haven't really resolved that yet, even though there have been close moments between the mm-hmm. two of them, you know, in a more of a brotherly, sisterly way, or more of a, a way of, uh, they just generally respect each other as people. It's also fine if they don't kiss, they are actual children and they can <laughs> have a, a romantic relationship. And where are they? We, we are 16, 17 years old or something. Like I know this, Gwen those is canonically 17 because we saw her origin quote 17 years ah, 17 ago. years ago. Yes. I don't yes, think Dow's been given an actual marker. Someone is screaming at their phone if that's wrong. Um, I I imagine him in my head canon to be about 15. Okay. And slightly shorter. So maybe he's just hasn't had his growth spurt yet. I don't know. <laughs> maybe there are short people, you know, like my people. Who knows? <laughs> Uh, but, you know, let's let's start and, and break things down from mm-hmm. episode to episode. So let's start with Kobayashi. This is episode six. Yeah. Now, it's obviously a spin off of the Kobayashi Maru, the, the famous scenario or infamous scenario, however you want to put it, of the no-win scenario, the character, the, the choice that the captain has to make uh, or the choice that a command track level cadet has to make in this process to learn how to become a captain. Captain Kirk said this to Savick in Star Trek II. He said, it's a matter of character, mm-hmm. not the choice that you make. Mm-hmm. It's how you live with that choice. And we understand that as Star Trek fans, and I know that the younger cadets probably are younger viewers, probably don't really get that at first. But for the older viewers, we know that. So we kind of skip to the next more obvious question is the voice acting sound bites 
in that episode. <laughs> okay. Now I don't like being overtly critical about certain things because I do love this series, but to be fair, the voice acting sound bites as perfectly placed as they were did come off a little jarring because especially with Leonard Nimoy, with all mm-hmm. due respect, mm-hmm. they picked eras of Leonard Nimoy that really did not play off against each other very well. Did you did you feel that as well? Do you agree with it? Definitely. And okay. if you are if you've been around as long as Norm and I have, you sit there and you go, well, that's from the movie and that's from this episode and that's from the 09 movie. And you can you can hear really hear the differences, particularly with um, and, and Uhura as well, the, mm-hmm. the TOS characters where just the quality of equipment and the technique has evolved so much since that time. I appreciated that the characters that we chose to homage in Kobayashi were a mix of uh, some of the great talent that's no longer with us. Um, and then some of the most iconic ones, um, sure. like right, Uhura, like Nichelle Nichols, obviously still around. And it's still a huge presence in the fandom. Um, but oh, in terms of like I- iconic character portrayals, I don't know if you can be Uhura. Like she's probably tippity top. It did make me question because we got a screener. So I always wonder with uh, clunky things like that, if it's just that we have a slightly unfinished version, which does happen. I've had screeners where there's been no CG in a live action superhero show at all. It's just a panel that says Flash and Grodd fight, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can kind of live with that. But uh, uh, I've seen the full theatrical episode since then. And it seems like it's pretty much what you and I listened to in the screener. Yeah. It does make me wonder if it would have been a stronger choice to pick four or five actors who are still alive and just have them record completely new lines. Mm-hmm. I do think in terms of the narrative reason why we were driven to seeing these characters in the first place, I think this is a great way to do fan service. It completely made sense why it was all of these characters in this place at one time versus sometimes that happens and it's a little bit clunkier. So it's, it's hard because, you know, everybody worked their best with the audio that they were given, but I mean, it's a point of contention because, because ultimately you can hear the difference. Well, I guess sometimes it's uh, we can debate whether it was a, an issue of quality and an issue of production timing, or was it a conscious creative decision to mm-hmm. keep the the quality of those sound bites, uh, sound bites intact so that they would have the proper emotional connection with certain audiences? Yeah. Because we do, like you said at the beginning, we do know where a lot of these quotes come from, especially where ne- Leonard Nimoy is concerned. Yeah. And they come from the context of episodes that do lean into Kirk being advised by Spock for this particular scenario, this Kobayashi Marie scenario that is now being part of, uh, of Dal's backstory. Mm-hmm. So it's not like they're just pulled from a whim. You know, exactly. they do actually do have meaning and they have meaning for us. I do think that there could have been maybe a little bit more post-processing involved just in terms of kind of even out the levels because some of the audio did spike a little heavy, mm-hmm. uh, especially in Leonard's performances, but he did have a lion's share of the narrative. So that's just one thing. It doesn't change how I emotionally feel about the episode because at the end of the day, it's about the connection, the emotional connection that you have uh, with the episode. And, and that kind of leads into the next episode with First Contact. Now, I'm not sure about how you felt about Dow in the first five episodes. I know that out there in social media, there were people out there that wanted to grab him by the throat <laughs> And slap him for being as cocky as he was is and primarily because we've never seen a character like him as uh, as grading. Mm-hmm. Let's say that, you know, and I mean, even Kirk in 2009, as cocky as he was, there is a certain cockiness and swagger about Kirk, but not from a 15 to 17 year old alien boy. Like, how dare he? Who was he? Then you see this episode. <laughs> and then you see is everything that he is right now, that everything that makes Dal, is it all a defense mechanism because he's so deeply wounded inside from what Nandi, the Ferengi who raised him, has done to him and is still doing to him? Well, the flip part of me wants to say, have you never met a boy before? And then the uh, equally flip part of me says, have you never met a child? <laughs> have you ever met a teenager before? True. Because we all thought we could run the world at that age. So- 
did I find Dell particularly great? No. Um, he wasn't my favorite character, but that was okay. Like, look, Rock Talk was right there. He was never going to be my favorite character. She's the best we love. Um, so no, I didn't find him grading. And I've seen that archetype enough in um, the two shows I always evoke, Star Wars Rebels and uh, Avatar The Last Airbender, to know that he's not going to be that way forever. It's okay. I was, I was shocked at how much people didn't like him, honestly, because I was like, mm-hmm. at least he has a cool look. Like, that can sustain you until he becomes a good person. Like, and he wasn't that much different than Esri. Come right? on. Absolutely. Uh, or Ezra. Um, I should say Ezra Bridger. Well, and, well, or even or even Esri, who is a very young character who's trying to find her place. Like mm-hmm. there there are moments of that character, which is why she works so well with Julian, yeah, true. Um, where you're like, what are you even doing right now? Uh, so I think I think your Freudian slip was absolutely uh, uh, correct as well to bring in a live action example there. Um, <laughs> but first contact, uh, not only fun name. But sure. also, I think I think you're right, like really does a good job at opening up for us why Dal is the way he is. And it also opens it up to the crew, which the whole the whole ethos of the show up to this point has been like bringing them together as family and a unit. And when they understand that about him as well, you can kind of see how Gwyn in particular kind of softens. Um, as a, she's always been an authority figure over him, even though he is debatably the captain. She's certainly been a, a I don't know, an elder states, but it's funny to say that, but you know, two years or a year can be really different when you are a younger person. Um, and to see her kind of on board that and how she adjusts her behavior to him after is what I thought was really, really interesting that not only for the audience, this is open up who Dal is, but it really opens up for the rest of the crew beyond just like, oh yeah, like you had a hard childhood, like cute, so did I, you know, hold my beer. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Children drink beer (laughs) is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, you know, it's... um... It's interesting when you get to see uh, like certain snippets of of the characters' pasts. I mean, we I'm not sure if we'll get that with Rock, uh, but she did have a very interesting turn in the next I hope episode. So. I hope I hope we do too. Uh, Murph maybe not so much because Murph is a facilitator of greatness. He just yes. facilitates greatness throughout the. He, he's this glue, uh, so to speak. You know that 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 ties these episodes together in various forms. Jankum, I'm still waiting to have a great Jankum episode. I agree. Because I think that uh, Jason uh, has an incredible voice talent for uh, Jason Matsukis. Mm-hmm. Uh, that uh, voice is Rock. Who voices Rock has a great ability to create that inflection because Rock, I mean, sorry, with uh, Jankum, he does get wounded at times, but no one takes Jankum seriously enough. And uh, I hope that we get that as the audience. But when it, when it comes to where, where Dal's at in this episode, all you need to do is see like where he slept on Nandi's ship. And then you get to see that little porthole, which yep. flashes all the way back to the porthole that he shared with, or the memory that he shared with Gwen in Lost and Found and said, okay, this is the origin story of that emotional beat. And you're like, oh, that's tragic, right? You know, his he's an urchin in space. Uh, and, and you're right. He's you know, Oliver, yeah. Yeah. And then when you see Gwen, yeah, Gwen is kind of like the, um, uh, the, the fairy tale princess, but not because you know everything is has been provided for her but not so that there is a tragedy of you know opposite levels but at the same time though it's the tragedy of not having confidence in the person that you believe is supposed to be taking care of you you know the person that authority figure in your life um, and, and speaking of which we're going to dovetail that into the next episode time amok the best episode Janeway has been taken away in a way from uh, being able to mentor her crew the way that she would like uh, in the way that her, she was temporarily split. And that means that she only had enough time to be able to parse information to certain members of her crew. In that episode, they showed like a temporal effect and rock was at the furthest edge of this temporal effect, which means her time moved the most slowest. So she was alone for the longest amount of time. Rock to us has always been this character that we want to hug and protect and nurture and comfort because all she's wanted in her entire life is family. And that has been taken away from her up to a point. We don't know how long she was gone from them, removed from them. In your headcanon, because she was able to learn so much science and learn so much about the ship and programming and et cetera, how long do you think she was alone? This is a question that I think about often because, and I think we said this in the episode, it gives me real Groundhog Day vibes. 
And I know somebody did the math recently based on like the averages that it takes to learn languages and things like that. And Groundhog Day should have taken something like 10,000 years. I don't think Rock was stuck for 10,000 years, but I think it was somewhere between two days and a week. Mm -hmm. And that's a long time for anyone to be alone, even even in the comfort of your home with all the things that you like, say, if you're a partner or your roommate or your parent goes away on a trip and you're on your own, like it's, it's a long time. And it's certainly a long time to do that in, in silence and in the hopes that what you're doing will actually pay off and, uh, you know, basically save your entire world. So I think it's probably somewhere around a week at the longest, but a week of self-reflection and a week of work can definitely change a person and rock does feel much more mature after also i believe she quotes how many times she tried and failed and it is far more than a hundred times which is the so many times and it's a complex science right this isn't we're making a volcano for the science fair like she is dealing with if she had done this wrong she would have exploded and that would have just been the end of the story i don't know how long do you think it is so she, it was 271 or something like that. It was over yeah. 200 and something times. I always believed that she tried once a day. Mm. So it's possible that she could have no. been for th- almost three quarters of a year, a little over yeah. three quarters of a year, yeah, which yeah, is yeah, like yeah, eight yeah. or nine months. And that's possible. Like we don't know the exact science of it, but one of the things that always kind of broke my heart is how much she tried to make everything normal. Mm-hmm. You know, she, she made Murph sure plushie. that the, the Murph plus she making sure that the beds were slept in, making sure that she did her nighttime routine of saying good night to everybody. Mm-hmm. That was important to her. And I think that when you take, when you take that as an example and you kind of juxtapose it to how assertive she was with Jank and Pog at the end of the moral star part two in the mm-hmm. engine room, you see that somewhere along the line as characters that are invested in, in that vulnerability that rock had, or used to have, we've missed like a parent, we've missed the moments where we, we were hoping to watch her grow. Mm -hmm. Those are just now moments that are, are left to, you know, our imagination of when she had to go through her own isolation. Yeah. And, uh, for, for better or for worse, for a healthy outcome or not, that's something that may come into play later on because we may not know like how, how hardened rock may have become. <laughs> that's a pun, right? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> how hardened rock may have become. And we don't want that for her. We never wanted that for her. Right. But maybe that's what she needed for herself. We don't know. That's a great speculation about a character like rock. You have this great subversion of expectation with the physicality of her, this giant hulking rock. Like she's basically Ben Grimm. But, mm-hmm. you know, trapped in the body of a six to seven year old, maybe nine year old little girl mentally. You yeah, know, so. yeah. 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 Uh, so, yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting to see uh, what happens, you know, with Rock there. But we do know that she was able to learn enough to get him out of trouble. And that brings us to looking at, say, the last two episodes, the two parter that ended this first 10 episode sequence which is a moral star parts one and two. Now, unfortunately they never really made as much of a big deal as it being an anagram for Tars Lamora. They kind of, the, the Hagman's kind of like uh, burst that bubble on social media, even before the episode came out, but the most significant thing, and we we didn't mention from you first. So I'm giving you the credit. And I heard it from our producer Earl green first, uh, (laughs) who I would just blew me away because that's what Earl does. He just has that capacity to do that. So we did mention this on our, on our specific show on a moral star, both one mm-hmm. and two, that this was written by the entire writing team. Yep. The Hagemans, the Bensons, Lisa Schultz, uh, Nikhil Jayaram, uh, Deandra Pendleton Thompson, Chad Quant, Aaron Waltke, and directed by Ben Hibon. I mean, this is the A team of A teams for Prodigy. This is their creative staff, mm-hmm. aside from like artists, aside from Nami, you know, um, and the voice actors. This is who creates this. The, the, this is the team that creates the story. When you have this much talent in a room, and interestingly enough, uh, there was a recent uh, post on, I think the, uh, the Hageman shared this on Twitter uh, in the last few days. Um, there's a picture of all of them in a, in a Zoom meeting mm-hmm. saying that they've never met each other. Like they've all been th- contacting each other and creating through Zoom. Imagine that. But this team created this two-part emotional 
time bomb, like for all of us, because it showed where the characters have come from and where the characters are in the span of technically 44 minutes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I know that this, it's, it's hard to kind of encapsulate a, a general reaction or general feeling <laughs> for like uh, one or two episodes, but how did this rank for you uh, in, in terms of the episode so far? I know that you said that Tamamak is your favorite. It is. But, okay. It definitely is. Um, but favorite and like best are not always the same thing. I think that is a lesson that fandom needs to learn a little bit more. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm going to put that aside. I think... I think A Moral Star Part 1 and 2, if you look at them as a singular episode, are hands down the best episode of Prodigy that we've had so far. They just mm -hmm. do so much. They blow open the world in such an interesting way. They push the boundaries of uh, what storytelling for this audience can be, particularly with Zero and what happens with the Diviner and Gwyn. Um, and we get a lovely wink at what is going to come, which I know we're going to talk about in a little bit. I just think a moral star does so much more and dares to do so much more than all the rest of the episodes. And I know this is only like the, the halfway point or the halfway of the halfway point, but this feels like a proper series finale. Like if we, right? if we knew we weren't getting any more prodigy till next year, I'd be like, what a, what a great ending. What a powerful, unexpected ending. So I, I truly have nothing but good things to say about it. <laughs> but I, I'm, and I'm glad that you, you waited as, a, as one episode, being mm -hmm. successful as one episode. But when you have this much talent, you kind of look for those. I mean, if you want to. I mean, you kind of look for those moments where like, is there too much happening yep. in one area and not enough in another area? And I actually do believe that that happened. I think that and a moral star part one, I think was more emotionally impactful. And I think a little bit more weighted towards this is the episode that you really need to pay attention to say versus a moral star part two, primarily because that's mm -hmm. where the cadets got the uniforms, you know, and that scene was probably one of the most emotionally hard hitting scenes I've like ever seen in star Trek, because you see where these characters, these kids have come from and what they have learned. And then eventually what they have earned, they earned to wear these colors, right? They earned to wear yes. the cadet uniforms mm -hmm. that they were wearing. They earned to wear, uh, to wear the, the Starfleet Delta, the badge that, that Dal was, uh, refused, refused to accept that would be any part of his life in the very first episode. And now they're depending on it. You know, they're depending on all of this training to pull them through. And I felt that it was just this, it wasn't even just character growth. It was this rebirth, this, uh, mm -hmm. you know, of all of these characters into this new family, you know, because I think that's where in Star Trek, when we see everyone get together out of civilian clothes and put on their uniforms, they become something different. They transcend into something that they can truly depend on. And that's each other, you know, and Janeway, because when Janeway, yeah. like hologram she's, Janeway put on the suit, it's like, okay, everyone's she's an important part of the crew. We know. Oh, yeah, we totally. Know. <laughs> and I, I never felt that it was the same way with a moral star part two, but there was something in that episode that I felt truly was controversial for me. Mm -hmm. And that was zero psychically attacking the diviner because that was zero's only way to stop the diviner or that's what they thought. Mm -hmm. And then the aftermath of what happened to the Definer, where he is essentially trapped in the prison of his own mind. And we don't know exactly what's going to happen to him after that. So watching that unfold on the episode and seeing kind of like the intensity of that moment, I always felt that that's just something in Prodigy I have not yet seen something. And it really went like off the scale in terms of intensity. Mm -hmm. How did you feel about that? I thought it was awesome in the true sense of the word in that it was awe inspiring uh and and awe not always being uh not always being a good thing right as if you were to look on a, a monster right in the, in the classically greek sense i appreciate that they were like yeah you think this is a kid's show but we can still do pretty intense things but if you look at it on an objective scale of violence compared to a lot of other kids shows, it's, it's not that violence. Mm -hmm. It's dealing a lot more with the psychological. And I think that is a very interesting lesson to be putting in a show that is for viewers of all ages and what that's ultimately going to tell us. And I, I think I come down on liking it because it was very beautifully done. It is very scary, but because of what happened 
everyone needs each other a little more and everyone has to lean on each other a little more to make sure that we're all going to be okay. Obviously there's going to be still some conflict that comes out of this and and probably a little baby betrayal, but we're all going to come through the fire better for it. So I think, I think the more we see what this has accomplished and how this has changed people, the more I'm going to come to like it, but I don't have a three-year-old I'm trying to watch this with. And I can Mm -hmm. definitely understand how, for some of the the very young viewers, this might be a little too intense or a little too much. Right, and that's kind of like where I was coming from, yeah. you know, just with my concern because, uh, you know, and uh, the episode that we did before, our, our supplemental prior to this, we were talking about how it was marketed or has mm-hmm. it's still being marketed as a quote unquote kids show. So, you know, kids obviously you're you're dealing with a, a younger audience of kids, anywhere between three to six, three to nine, and then you have the young adult audience, which. Are they still considered kids? I yeah. mean, legally. <laughs> right. So, yeah. So you're dealing with like 10 to 15, 16, anywhere between um, where, where Dal and Gwyn are as peers, mm-hmm. you know, so they're, they're uh, you know, maybe connecting with those two characters in a very specific young adult kind of way. But that's like, you know, when you're dealing with like a four or five year old, when you're a parent and you're like, hey, let's watch Star Trek together. And everything's been very safe. Mm -hmm. up to a point, you know, visually. Mm -hmm. And then you have this, it's just something I said, "Hmm, that would be interesting to see or hear about. And hopefully uh, parents, our our older uh, officers will be able to write in about their, you know, their experiences with their younger cadets on that scene. I would, I would love to hear uh, people's specific experience with their children, with, with some of the more challenging material, future supplemental. I mean, even the thorns, like uh, from um, Terra Firma, even oh, the thorn yeah, monsters. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I thought that was extreme a little bit, you know? Even even Dreadnought is like genuinely scary looking. Yeah, especially when he goes spider form. You yeah, know, I'll yeah, let you know. Okay, so now we're done with the first half of the first season, season one being 20 episodes. Here's what we, here's what we know. Mm-hmm. And then maybe we can speculate on a little bit on, you know, what we think is going to happen before we have to end the show. So we do know that there will be a full 10 episode back half run. So it's not going to yes. be chopped into two, five episode segments Ooh. like we have endured here. We know based on the Hageman's last supplemental interview that uh, we had with them that Jane Way, for better or for worse, or however they're going to be, uh, however the Protostars team is going to interpret uh, her involvement is going to be the antagonist. Yes. That we didn't expect because she's now after the ship because she's now after Chicote, who she believes is still out there based on whatever mission that he's on, maybe for her. So sometimes it's weird when you have, uh, you know, you have uh, someone who's chasing you and you don't know if they're good guys or bad guys. All you know is that they're chasing you. Yeah. Yeah. And that, yeah, yeah. And that'll be a really interesting dynamic. What do you think about that? I am very interested to see how that plays out. And if there is an actual conflict between those two characters that I know you and I hold really dear, I can see I can see high emotions for the fandom for Twitter uh, in in the in the back half of the year. But I also think it's going to continue because our world's gotten a little bit bigger, right? It was the asteroid and then it was the protostar Mm -hmm. and then it was the Delta Quadrant. And now it's. I mean, I guess arguably all of time and space, if you use the prototype correctly. True enough. Yeah. <laughs> but, but we're certainly opening up to other crews, right? Uh, becoming an immediate part of the drama. And I'm very interested to see, like, what does a Janeway crew look like? We have like we have Jamila Jamil, we have David Diggs, we have these like powerhouse talents who we know were announced as part of the cast who are finally going to be coming into their own in the back half. So, like, that's very exciting. But, like, what does a quote, modern day Janeway crew look like? What does a quote, modern day Chakotay look like? How do they interact with each other? How are they going to interact with our crew? Because the Protostar crew, yes, hollow Janeway is there, but it still feels very separate Mm -hmm. from this other sort of post-Voyager drama that's going on. And I think now that we've learned how to operate as a crew, I think we're learning diplomacy in the back half of this season. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, You know, uh, without without doing first contact but this is a first contact in a way this will be their first contact with a proper starfleet crew right and what does that mean and i think that that is a very interesting twist on the narrative as we've sort of seen in these back half episodes where we're taking things that we're familiar with if you're a trekkie 
but we're seeing them through a slightly different lens. We're seeing them massaged in a different way. And I think it's all very exciting, honestly. And there will be that aspect of now, which adults do you trust? Because we all know that not every single member of Starfleet is mm-hmm. always the most trustworthy. Or yeah, if they're an admiral, they're evil. It's just a fact. Yeah, that's, that, that's tradition. You know, and, and who are we to buck with tradition, right? The diviner. Let's talk about the diviner a little bit because when you sign somebody on, and this is the realist in us, because you know, when you sign yes. somebody on, you know, a talent as strong and as powerful and uh, as as well known as John Noble, you're going to sign an actor like that on for a decent contract, you know, mm-hmm. and a decent amount of performances or a decent amount of lines, you know, negotiated for that contract. I have to believe that we're going to see the diviner in some form or another again, which means how badly injured was he by zero? And will the order restore him? Whatever the order is, the order was dropped in the background of that 17 year flashback. I believe that was during yes. first contact yep. and that was it. That's all we heard about the order. Well, I don't think he's going to be like a Futurama head in a jar. I don't think he's that that badly decimated. We did see him in his full cor- full corporeal glory um, as he was thrown into the pit at the end. But I will say John Noble did do a one episode guest star on Legends of Tomorrow. So like the man is down. Mm-hmm. But I agree with you. I think he, like most of the talent, is, is was probably signed for the whole season. And then it was... How often is he going to pop up here and there? I think the order will come back into it. What I would like to see, I would like to see the Diviner and Gwyn come to an understanding. Like, I would love it if he's like a doddering old man that she sets up in like a space apartment somewhere and goes to check on him sometimes. I don't think that's what we're getting. Uh Uh, I think he's probably getting a triumphant return toward the end of the season to further complicate things. And then since we know he is from the future, I could see him being sent back or enacting a plan to go back to the future in his DeLorean. And then Gwyn being stuck with the question of, does she go to like where, who is her real family? Where does she belong? Um, Sure. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Kind of as um, an echo back to Dal's decision about whether or not he was going to, stay with Nandi and be a space pirate or if he was going to fulfill fulfill his full potential. But there's no way we're not getting more diviner. And if you are, uh, shame on you for doing such things to the steward of Gondor. Shame on you. (laughs) Well, yes. I mean, you don't want to just bring him wood and oil because we don't (laughs) really want that for him right now. Uh, The big, big, big question is, when are we going to get our Jank and Pog episode? Like the episode that really gives us the insight to Jank and Pog. That's what I want. So... (laughs) I I hope it's in this back half. Mm-hmm. I hope it's somewhere in these 10 episodes. I hope it's early. I hope it's like episode because one and two are going to be sort of a, a sister two-parter, right? Reintroducing us to the world, establishing who these other crews are, uh, you know, kind of like how the series began. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm hoping around episode 13, 14 before 15 is still going to feel like a mid-season finale, even though we're getting the back half all at once. So I'm hoping somewhere in those early mid-seasons, but I will say, even if it doesn't happen anywhere in these 10 episodes, I know that the Hagemans, based on their past work, are incredibly smart and that they listen to fans when a good idea comes along. And developing Jankum Pog as a real character is a good idea. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I know that even if it doesn't happen this season, it is coming. And it's just a matter of how patient we have to be until it comes. But he could not have a focused episode and still have really great moments and really great character development like we saw um, in Immoral Star Part 1 and 2. So as long as he's getting something, something worthy of the character's greatness and Jason Matsukas' greatness... I'm, I'm going to be okay. When do you think that episode's going to drop, though? Well, I know that when we talked to uh, the brothers, they mm. did say that they cast a very specific voice actor for a very specific Tellarite who's mm-hmm. supposed to have a very specific interaction with Jank mm-hmm. and Pog. So I would think that probably in the next five episodes, we're going to get that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and we'll see. But I really do think that Jankum is probably like the most unsung character who has some of the better one-liners because I think that that's the way this character has been, you know, kind of like uh, tailored to be. But there is something there that 
definitely is working on him. I mean, I, when he was staring at the the anomaly and saying that that's the physical representation of how Jank and Pog feels, I mean, he does have a deep inner emotional core to him that I think is also being uh, maybe protected by humor, you know, the mm-hmm. way that people use humor to shield themselves from, you know, emotional trauma. So there's something there. And, and I think that's worth exploring. And traditionally do that through insults. So True. by switching it to be humor, particularly for the audience, the intended audience or mm-hmm. uh, the marketed audience, I think is a great choice. Yeah. So I, I hope sooner than later, but again, if, if the Hagemans are going to promise us that particular scene, it's going to be worth the wait. That Absolutely. is for sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So that's it for us, Ashley. That was a fantastic recap of the, the back half of season one the back half of the first half of season one. I, say. And, I know uh, we're like this quarter and this eight, uh, we sound like we're financial people. But... It's going to be nice to have just like one string of 10 episodes. Where we're like, these 10 episodes are what we're going to talk about this time. Oh, it's going right? to be so, so good. Soon. Friends, friends, you know what that means. This means we've reached the end of our show. Said face. Mm-hmm. Thank you to everyone who joined us here on Mission Love Prodigy. We love you. If you've enjoyed our show, please make sure that you smash your like and share and subscribe buttons to the Mission Love Prodigy playlist on Roddenberry Entertainment YouTube channel or find us on your podcast catcher of choice. Mission Love Prodigy is produced by Roddenberry Entertainment, production and technical direction by the infallible Earl Green. Our website and your opportunity to comment and connect with us is missionlogpodcast.com. And if you would like to support Mission Log directly, and why wouldn't you? You can do so at patreon.com slash mission log. Yes, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ashley, for being here with me. Thank you, all of you, for listening. And make sure that you do follow us because we are going to be trying our very best to make sure that you get all the information and all the dates and all the timelines straightened out so that you don't miss a single minute of when Prodigy comes back. And it'll be back before you know it. Every single week forward is a week closer to the release of Star Mm -hmm. Trek Prodigy. So make sure that you subscribe. Make sure that you follow us here on the Roddenberry Entertainment channel on YouTube. Make sure you listen to your podcasts. And we will see you again next time. This is a Roddenberry podcast. For more great podcasts, visit podcast.roddenberry.com.